avoid and look of trouble. Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, and therefore judgment comes forth for burdens. I will stand at my watch point and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous live by their faith. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, not yet. Wait, we have another one. It is the word of the Lord. The Lord has some more words of the Lord. From Luke's Gospel. He entered Jerusalem, Jericho, Jesus, and he was passing through it. And a man there named Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up. And said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He is going to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Zacchaeus had two big problems. 
Not only does everyone in Jericho, except for his wife, detest him for being a tax collector, a leg man for the Roman IRS, who, following the practice of the day, raked in as much more than when the going tax was as he could and pocketed the difference. But he also had a big time problem of being short, like really short, like maybe four foot ten short. I feel big next to that. So for all of his bucks in the bank, Zacchaeus is a loser on two counts. And the crowd, way deep waiting for Jesus to pass through that day, wasn't about to let this nasty old tax collector get up front to be able to see. And so, he's no shrinking violet. He's not going to give up that easily. And he really didn't give two cents about what anybody thought about him. He had also learned, as all of us vertically challenged folk do, how to be strategic. Zacchaeus was bound and determined to get a clear sight line of this Jesus guy. So he runs ahead and climbs a sycamore tree. It really is a ridiculous image. Even today, though, the very rich often have little regard for propriety. They're free to behave eccentrically. When you're rich, you have nothing to prove. Zacchaeus, being a rich man, was free to do something ridiculous. Climb a tree in order to see this guy. Nothing was going to interfere with his sight line. And finally, the parade gets to him. People are shouting, waving, jumping up and down, reaching out to shake Jesus' hand. It's general pandemonium. Now, if you really want to talk about sight lines, out of a whole mess of the whooping and the hollering people, who is it that Jesus' eyes lock on? But not is the key, it's up in a tree. Jesus stops, looks up at that soft little shyster and opens his mouth to speak. And I'm sure that all of the Jericho was holding their breath to hear what he's going to say. I'm sure they were thinking, this is going to be good. He's going to give him holy hell. Woe unto you! Repent, you little worm up there. Wise up! That's what they're expecting. But what does Jesus say? Zacchaeus, come on down out of there. I'm going to your place for dinner today. Zacchaeus is thrilled out of his head. The good news of the invitation to Zacchaeus, though, has got to be distinctly bad news for the crowd. They're appalled. Look at this. This Jesus is going to hold of a total slime bucket for lunch. It doesn't make any sense. Chaos was reigning. Where is the justice in this? Habakkuk asked the same question. Where is the justice? How long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Everywhere I look, it's a mess. Violence, plundering, strife, contention. The law is powerless, justice absent. Talk about sight lines. Everywhere Habakkuk looks, all he can see is darkness. It is easy to make a contemporary Habakkuk, like that word, list of gloom and doom. It is hard to hold fast to the vision of this country as a land of opportunity for all after how we have treated the refugees and asylum seekers at our borders, separating children from their parents, putting them in cages. It's hard to believe in justice for all when the disturbing over-representation of African Americans in prisons. African Americans make up 13% of the general US population and 40% of all the inmates held in prisons and 42% of those on death row. It's hard to claim we are a nation of equality as the present administration systematically attempts to undo many protections the LGBTQ community has secured in recent years. 
It is easy to be the prophet of doom and cry out that God has abandoned us. It assuredly feels like that sometimes, doesn't it? Habakkuk cries this psalm of complaint and woe for us. And to Habakkuk's cry, God speaks back God's promise. Write the vision, make it plain. For there is still a vision. It speaks of the end and does not lie. The scriptural response to the cries of gloom and the predictions that we are on the eve of destruction is to simply call us back to the vision of God's promised land. To hold before our eyes the vision of God's paradise. It's a call to readjust our sight lines to God's sight lines. God tells Habakkuk to make every effort to keep the vision of the new world, of a world living in obedience to God's love and goodness before the eyes and hearts of the people around him. Do not forsake the dream. Hold fast to the vision, to God's sight lines. It's at work, and it's changing the world. Keeping the vision before us empowers us to live into that vision and then to live out that vision. As God tells Habakkuk, the righteous live by their faith. Was it living by faith that convinced Zacchaeus to climb that sycamore? I sometimes doubt it. Curiosity seems more likely. But for sure, he got a whole lot more than he was counting on. All Zacchaeus was worried about was getting a clear sight line. He had no inkling as he shimmied up that tree that in a matter of hours, his entire way of seeing would be irrevocably changed. As soon as Jesus sits down at dinner with Zacchaeus, <coughs> Zacchaeus grabs a glass of wine and launches into a big toast. Toasting himself more than his guests, really. I'm so glad to have you here at my table, Jesus. Despite all the talk you've heard about me in town, I'm really a nice guy after all. So nice that I'm going to give half of all that I get to the poor. And I might add, if I can be shown to have swindled anyone, I will make it up four times over. At such a magnanimous declaration of righteousness, you might expect Jesus to fall all over the kids. Tremendous. See, anybody, even a little weasel like Zacchaeus, can become a really nice guy if he's appealed to in the right way. That's why I always make it a practice to go and eat in the homes of sinful little losers like Zacchaeus so I can transform them into good people. But as usual, what we and probably Zacchaeus expects Jesus to say is not what Jesus ends up saying. This little tax collector thinks that thank God he has gotten over all his bad ways and become a really good person. Look at all I'm willing to do to settle my account with God. I'll pay back this, I'll give that. And Jesus blurts out before Zacchaeus even finishes his speech, Zach, today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, not the found. Did you say lost? And the little man puts down his Waterford crystal wine glass next to his gold-rimmed English bone china and ponders his real situation. Jesus has brought Zacchaeus off his high perch of presumed goodness and put him back down on the only place where he can truly receive Jesus into his house or heart as one of the lost, the least, the very little. I save, says Jesus, only the lost. Little Zacchaeus, attempting to stand on the ladder of his own goodness, 
to get up to God's level through his own means can't do it. Nor can we. Instead, Zacchaeus is raised up by a judge who loves to raise the dead and to find the lost and to save the condemned and to eat and drink with sinners. Zacchaeus, clutching his newfound good works and noble virtues, will sink like a stone in the flood of God's judgment. His only claim to fame is that he is just one more loser in a long history of God's preference for losers. Look, Zach, cool it, will you? I've got no use for all of this band of the year stuff, and I don't give a hoot about your certificate of recognition from the United Way or your collection of Sunday school perfect attendance pins. My parade is moving toward the death that you are avoiding. I'm on my way to make the world safe for losers like you by a great, wonderful loss of my own. What a change in sight lines. Zacchaeus started that day thinking that the most wonderful thing was going to be able to get a clear look at this Jesus during the parade. And then the most wonderful thing becomes having Jesus to his house for dinner. And then the most wonderful thing was toasting his own self-justification of what a good guy he really was. But in the end, the most wonderful thing became Jesus' pronouncement of salvation, not for his industriousness in climbing the tree, not for his supposed generosity of giving, not for a delicious dinner, but because salvation was exactly why God sent Jesus to earth, so that all who believe would know eternal life. Fred Buechner calls this story of Zacchaeus the gospel in Sycamore. It's all about God's sight lines, God's vision, not ours. It's all about faith in the person of Jesus, not in our good works, not our gold star behavior, not our personal wisdom, not our self-justifications. The just shall live by faith and are justified by faith. God has set before us a mighty vision. Will we have the sight lines to believe it and then to live it? Eight-year-old Ben, whom Paul Harvey once spoke about on his radio spot, he believed it, and he lived it. It seems that Ben had won a contest at his local McDonald's, and the prize was a brand new bike. Everyone in the store was congratulating him on his good fortune, but Ben told his parents that he really already had a bike. He didn't need two. So he gave the new bike to a classmate who lived up the street and who didn't have a bike, and who knew the family medical bills wasn't likely to have one for a very long time. Now, as Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. When the manager of the McDonald's heard what Ben had done, she invited Ben and his family to dinner. The manager also presented Ben with a $100 Walmart gift certificate. Ben immediately went to the store and used that gift certificate to buy a bicycle safety helmet for his classmate up the street. True story. It is all about sight lines, about how we're looking and how we see. And specifically, it is about altering our sight lines and putting them in focus with God's sight lines. Amen? Amen. Yeah.